you literally, in my eyes, in my opinion, are the grandmother of of travel, but not in a way that you're old, in a way that like you're the godfather, the godmother, in my opinion. Like you Change you have single handedly changed the trajectory of this industry. Hello, welcome to episode number nine of the Nomadic Care Show. This episode I'm super excited to share with you guys. It's actually going to be an episode I recorded with my really good friends, Kim and Aaron Gibson, a while ago, all about how Nomadic Care got started, a lot of the behind the scenes stuff about Nomadic Care, about staffing agencies. It's such a fun conversation. We laugh, we cry, we tell jokes. It's going to be great. And uh, Kim and Aaron, if you don't know them, definitely follow along on their journey. They've been travelers for They've been travelers for so long. They've been travelers for years and years. They are a dynamic duo who has a company called Travcest. They've made these really cool backpacks that I use all the time for travelers. They've got these, they've got these like adventure trips they do where maybe like 20 travelers go to each trip. Right now, I think they're in Patagonia and they're going to Peru later and Bali later with groups of travelers. They're just so fun. So if you don't know Kim and Aaron, follow them. They've got a podcast called Travcest and um, enjoy the episode today and the conversation we had with them a few months back. Welcome to In Route, the Power of Travel podcast. We are your hosts, Kim and Aaron. And in this episode, I'm just so excited to bring you this episode because we finally got it on the books after a year of constantly planning and trying to get it worked out. And we finally did. And it is an amazing episode. We get the chance to interview our dear friend and mentor and somebody who single-handedly has changed travel healthcare for the better for the traveler. And we get to interview Laura from Nomadic Care. And we talk about Nomadic Care all the time in the podcast. We she's been a sponsor of the show. And you know, if you haven't heard of Nomadic Care, if you've been under a rock in the travel world lately, um, Nomadic Care is a tech company that basically vets recruiters. And then pairs you, pairs you as the traveler with these recruiters. And these recruiters are the best in the business. They're the most honest, the highest paying. Um, and honestly, with the, the tech side of it, you get to put in your, your uh, location that you want to go. And it will literally pair you up with the recruiters that have contracts in that area. And then benefits that you're looking for. It is literally next level resource for travelers. And we dive into the story of not only just kind of what nomadic care is and and how awesome it is for the traveler, but literally the story behind how it was created. And that's the main focus of this podcast because we know everything there is to know about nomadic care, but hearing this story just connected me with her and the company even more. And that's why I cannot wait for you to hear it. Well, and I love that because we know Laura is one of our best friends and Nomadic Care is an incredible resource for travelers, but we really dig into her story, like her journey of how she created Nomadic Care, going from it being written down, the idea being written down on a napkin, drinking margaritas, to now being this monster Mm -hmm. in the healthcare traveling industry. So we really get into the journey that it took for her to make this dream of hers, this mission of hers, this passion of hers, into a reality and so she really opens up she gets real and honest she spills the tea she shares all the things we talk a lot about being bold and being brave and showing up and doing things afraid even when you don't want to and how she was able to build this thriving company from the ground up without having any business skills no business school skills she's an ot She was a traveler and she talks about how traveling really equipped her with the tools and the mindset to be an entrepreneur. Not only that, the the issue that sparked the idea was based off a bad experience as a traveler. Yeah. And she said, I need to change this. And she did. Yeah. And she did. She did. We talk about her traveling the world while building her company and how she bootstrapped her business by being scrappy and resourceful. She lived in her brother's basement with no windows and drove this like (laughs) rackety car like that the steering wheel was backwards or something crazy it had like a jingle and when she drove yeah like a tambourine oh it's hilarious and you know she really digs into the fear of you know leaving this steady 
full-time OT job with benefits, a, a consistent paycheck, and leaving that behind and transitioning into this entrepreneurial journey of uncertainty and unknown and having and being unpredictable and having absolutely no idea where any of this was gonna leave her, but following her heart and just going after it and going all in. And so she really shares just all the micro, all the details of this incredible journey she went on. And she's so inspiring and fun and just the stories. And we really take you behind the scenes on conversations that we get to have with her all the time. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, we, like I said, we know Laura. She's She's been a mentor of ours business-wise because she's always so positive. She's always so crystal clear. She always has the right things to say. And so to hear the story of her not being so disciplined and having to learn all of these things and some of the things that she did, the little takeaways that that she said that it kind of helped her, it was just mind blowing to me. We were like taking notes. Yeah. We were learning and she, oh, and then she talked about living in this house with all these other entrepreneurs, kind of like an incubator. And we we never even knew that. We're like, oh my gosh, like, that's so cool. How did you do that? So we kind of were asking the questions we wanted to know too. And it's just a fun conversation. You guys are gonna love it. Stay tuned to the end. It's a longer one, but there's no wasted words. Everything is just value packed. And we are excited to share with you. So without further ado, welcome to the podcast, Laura. Welcome. Okay, so excited about this show. Laura, welcome to Enroute the Power of Travel podcast. We were just saying before we went live that it's been about a year since we first planned this, but here we are, and I think you said it better. It's just divine timing. It's just right, and right now is the right time, and we couldn't be more excited. Oh my gosh. It, I know. I have been looking forward to this for forever. This is going to be awesome. I know. So thank you guys. Yeah, well, thank you. We've been so excited to have this conversation with you, not just for, obviously for our community, but also just Aaron and I, like we are selfishly wanting to just like pick your brain and, (laughs) you know, hear your story and your journey of creating this incredible empire and resource for the healthcare community. And so we're going to dig into all of the things on this episode. So we're- Yes, let's do it. There is no people I like talking about entrepreneurship with more than you guys. So this is going to be fun. Yeah. And we were just saying too before, like, you know, we, Aaron and I and Laura, we, we talk on the phone, you know, all the time and mm-hmm. we'll just, we'll be like, okay, let's just have a quick chat about, you know, X, Y, and Z. And three hours later, <laughs> you know, we're still on the <laughs> phone where we're all like falling asleep, like in bed. We're like, okay, guys. like It's so it true. I, I always get off those calls. Like we always go through a journey. I feel like half the time, like I'm sharing deep stuff, a tear, laughing is hard, so hard. I can't breathe. Like I just have the best time talking about l- the real crap that goes on in like entrepreneurship and stuff with you guys. It's so yeah, fun. Totally. And so that's what we want to do with you guys is take you on to one of our conversations yep. that the three of yep. us always have. And we're super excited. And let's, just- I, I, I think we have to start though, from the very beginning. I mean, if we're going through the beginning of all this, just kind of how we met, because we did do a podcast last week with uh, Emily Chang and we met her at TravCon. And what we've noticed is we, or Kim mainly, stalks people that she really likes on social media. <laughs> and then we set out on this like seek, seek and, or search and destroy mission to like make you be our friends. Um, and so we literally found you at TravCon and just that story of me running up to you at the last second um, and just introducing myself. And then I always love how you kind of tell that story um, of, of your, how you saw it. Um, but yeah, we met at TravCon. Yeah, we did. And, tra- and TravCon, for those of you who don't know, which I bet most of your listeners do, it's this huge conference in Vegas and it's always in September. And it is, I think it's where I've met some of my like genuine best friends, including you guys. But, you know, we ha- there's so many cool people that go to that. And this was, I, I don't know which, if this was, how many years ago it was now? It was 2017. Okay. And in that one, you guys were speaking for the first time 
I think you were doing, what were you speaking on? You were doing a round table and we were talking about traveling as a minimalist. (laughs) As a minimalist. Yes. And I also like, also knew you guys from the online world, but not in real life yet and thought, oh my God, this couple is like, like a door, like so cool and so fun to watch. And so I watched your journey from your own little stories that you do and stuff of how excited you guys were about speaking. And I was like, they are so cool. I have, so I wanted to meet you guys too, but it came to the very last day, which for those of you who have been to TrapCon know it ends with this ridiculous, amazing dance party up in the top of Dre's. And it is one of my favorite things to do every year. And it's like the end of the night, we have all like danced our faces off, had the best time. And Aaron and Kim come running over to me before we leave. And Kim's barefoot and Aaron has her high heels in his pocket of his front shirt. Like now that I know them, like, duh, that's what they would do. But it was so funny. And he's just like, we have to meet you before we leave. And it was just this quick, awesome, hilarious introduction. Yeah. And um, And then we met up again, like we met up, I think the first time to have like a real deep, you know, a deep, like a conversation or something. And where were we? Where did we meet up in California? So that's another funny story because we were, so Aaron and I were in San Diego and I think you were in the LA area for some, Mm -hmm. whatever reason. And so I had just started a new contract and we had talked about meeting in Long Long Beach. Beach Mm, yeah. And so I, we were like, yeah, let's do it. Let's put it on the books. Let's meet in person. Let's sit down and connect and talk and all the things. And so Aaron and I are like heading up to come meet you. And I get a call from my job that I just started. And they were like, Hey, Kim, just checking in. Uh, you're supposed to be here today. <laughs> are, is, is everything okay? You know? And I was like, I'm not working today. What do you, what do you mean? I'm off. Like I'm heading up to LA and they were like, no, you're on the schedule. Uh, You're supposed to be here. And I just completely like blew it off. (laughs) She was like, sorry. Sorry. I'm on my way to LA. Travelers, I wouldn't (laughs) advise this kind of behavior. That's right. This is not (laughs) advice guys. (laughs) However, I am so grateful you you did it. I know. (laughs) But it was so divinely led because like we ended up just having such a great day. We were only going to hang out for a couple hours and per usual we ended up spending like 12 hours together and really became fast friends from there I yep. mean really it just it was it was instant soul friends we were we were going to get like a quick lunch yeah. and we were also there with like um another awesome guy named Gabriel who was um yeah in that just like a sweetheart guy too and all four of us like from lunch. And then we're like, well, why don't we keep going? Why do we keep going? And we ended up at this amazing bar with like oh. wine and this, these huge fire pits out by the beach, like till way after the sunset. And we were finally just like, okay, we probably, you guys probably have to drive back, but oh. That was yeah. so fun. And here we are all these years later, still best friends and yes. just like sharing life together. And I just yeah. love that. So well, and then, well, one thing that we really connected with and, and loved, as we know, um, you've created Nomadic Care, but we've always just, you know, you're the person that we turn to, to, to run ideas off of, and just, you've always been there. So we want to hear your story of, from the beginning of that spark of just like, I'm going to create Nomadic Care and just really start way, way back. So hopefully you can go there with us. Yeah. For- yeah. Oh my God, for sure. So we're going to yeah, go ahead, Kim. No, I was going to say the, the journey from the beginning, if anyone has listened to the How I Built This podcast with Guy Raz, which is such, such a great podcast um, where entrepreneur, entrepreneurs share their journey of, of, of how they built companies that a lot of us are very familiar with and just the nitty gritty micro details of what it actually took to get there. And so that was mm-hmm. kind of what inspired this whole conversation is the how I built this but like traveler edition yeah. So, yeah so were you okay so from the beginning were you always entrepreneurial like from a kid where did you always have ideas did you do lemonade stands like were you always thinking of things to do is that natural to you to be an entrepreneurial to, to build something man for me no, it, it was not my entrepreneurship or even like the thought that I would have a business was so much. It was after college for sure. So when I was a kid though, I think I did have 
like my parents did a good job with um, in, like instilling in me to be bold and brave, but they didn't have the language. I didn't have the language to be like, you could create a business. My track from growing up in Texas was more like, well, you go to college, you get a job, you get married. It was like the most normal, like American dream thing ever back then. But I will say this, and I think this is a big part of just me and my journey is my parents as like sheltered and everything that we were, they were so supportive of us to do any hobbies we wanted. And there's something really special about um, my dad and the way he looks at us when we're like up to something we love. And it's like this really sweet twinkle that he gets in his eyes. And I swear we cannot do wrong by him. And so like anytime I would be like on stage because I was a theater kid or trying something new or doing anything, I could always find him in the crowd with his face. Like, oh my God, that's my kid. And he'd do it for my brother and my sister too. But he was like just so in love with, with his kids. And I think like somehow deep in me, I was like, I want that twinkle. Like I love it. So I think I always was trying to like do new things and get on stage and stuff. And my dad's like, ride is like drove me versus I think sometimes people get driven by like fear you know of like I don't want to let him down I was like oh I like I want to see that face mm -hmm. so they were beautiful awesome parents but but nope I was not an entrepreneur and I went to college just because like I picked my college because that's where my best friend went and I picked occupational therapy because um, the very first guy like boyfriend that I had like a love with and a significant relationship with got a traumatic brain injury from a car accident while we were together. So I got introduced to OT that way and decided, okay, I want to be an OT. But it was not until I started traveling and became a traveler. That is what gave me the skills of entrepreneurship, like hands down. I, I believe that so wholeheartedly. Mm. Huh. How long were you actually traveling for as an OT before you even got the idea of nomadic care? Cause you just jumped into traveling of like, Oh, I want to be a traveler and see the world and travel around the States and have these adventures mm -hmm. and freedom. And, and then nomadic care just kind of grew from that experience. But when, like, how long were you on the road before you were like, Ooh, Hmm, here's an idea. Yeah, it was, it was early on. Like I started traveling in 2010 and to, but two of those first years were in Australia because as an OT, we have, our license can just transfer to Australia with just paperwork. And if you're under 30, you can just go on like a work, a work holiday visa, I think they call it. Mm -hmm. So two years I was in Australia working. So even though I was like, traveling it wasn't the you know 13 weeks around the country yet and then I mean I, I did that went to Australia came back but it was my first year of traveling back from Australia that I came up with the idea and it was so that was like end of 2013 it's been a hot minute now wow. and and fun fact when I first started it um <laughs> well it was called the traveling therapists with a ts at the end now the hardest thing to say ever because <laughs> I would be like the traveling therapist with an S, <laughs> <laughs> like the worst name. And I had, I had that domain first and it was first going to be like for therapist. And then very quickly you realize, gosh, these issues are the same for nurses. They're the same for all the allied. And so, um, and so I came up with nomadic care, which kind of is a funny story of how I came up with that too. But, um, but regardless how nomadic care came about was I was on an assignment um, and you know, I found out like a lot of travelers do that. I was making a lot less than another traveler, the same job as me. We started the same date. We had the same company. We just had different recruiters. So it was the first time, even the thought went through my head, like, holy crap, this, this industry is based on sales. He took advantage of me. I was just so hurt and mad. And, um, and then <laughs> me and Stacia, my best girlfriend went out to margaritas. And we were, I was just like venting over margaritas. And, you know, after a few margaritas, you start thinking your ideas are real good. And so we ended up like, um, we ended up getting napkins from the waitress and a pin from her. We had nothing. And we just like sketched out this whole idea. And so I think there is something to be said of like a little bit of liquid, liquid juice, um, get your ideas rolling. A really good friend who will muse with you, you know, who will like let you just go there. And, um, 
And then I kind of think like this idea really picked me though, because we all have a million ideas throughout our life. And this one just held onto my heart and it, and it still holds onto my heart and became kind of the mission I was up to, you know, to help, help travelers. Um, I mean, it's the recruiter matchmaking, right? But it's so much more than that with just the mission of transparency and how unfair at least stacked it was against us, especially back in 2013. Yeah, no, it's funny because Kim and I always talk about the fact that our best ideas come over margaritas always. or, <laughs> and, and we have the built-in best friend, which is nice um, to have. Uh, but mm -hmm. we always try to, even tonight, we, you know, we have a lot of work planned and we're like, we have to go celebrate. We have to go and just kind of unwind, have some cocktails, sit and talk about, you know, next visions and things like that. So you're absolutely well, right on that. Some of our best ideas have come from tequila and margaritas. And, <laughs> yes. you know, like you said, when you're in the moment of it, of, you're like, whoa, this is the best idea I ever had. Like we're geniuses and you like dance the night away. <laughs> But it's like when you can wake up the next morning and be like, wow, mm. that really was something there. Like, let's kind of unpack this a little bit. Like, you know, you know, you're on to something. Yeah, no, that's totally. what I want to say is like you had the margaritas, you sketched this out on a napkin, which, by the way, I mean, that is such I mean, an entrepreneurial journey. Yeah. Isn't mean, that so cliche and iconic? I wish so much I still had those napkins. I think it's so funny. <laughs> I did for a while. They got lost in one of the moves, but for a while I, I had them. Like they were funny. They had drawings all over them and <laughs> it was so funny. Such a moment. So what was that next step, right? You have margaritas, you sketch it out, you wake up in the morning and you're like, oh, what did I do? And then you're like, oh, I came up with the best idea ever. Yes. What was, that, what was that next step? What was that action step? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, but I do want to say I just had this flashback, guys, of, of us three. This is when I was like, we were up in New England or something, and I was staying the night with you guys. And I think we had, I don't know if it was margaritas, but it was something that we got sent in the mail, right? Watermelon like, whiskey. Oh, it was watermelon. Yeah. Yeah, I know of Tracy and um, watermelon whiskey. And we were like, making vision boards but also we had like this idea of like oh my god what was it called um empowered travelers tribe the tribe, the tribe. it was the tribe it's where the shirts got yeah yeah that year and i just remember like literally as a little bit of like liquid liquid watermelon whiskey margaritas whatever we were like so excited that night and we like got a domain and did this and we had all these ideas and i'm like it's just so fun to have friends that think like that and go there and is like so excited that one didn't exactly like stick forever and ever but man that was but a fun night like, too I, I agree like when when you have friends that think a rock and night a fun wild night is you know drinking <laughs> margarita or watermelon whiskey and doing vision <laughs> and talking about like entrepreneurial ideas and yes. creative like those are the friends that I love yeah right <laughs> And they say like, oh God, I'd butcher every freaking quote in the world. But there's like some quote about like the, you know, some kind of people talk about other people. And then the next kind of people talk about like events that are happening. But then like the really good people you want to be around talk about ideas. You know, you're not wow. gossiping about other people. You're not necessarily even just talking about like, oh, this happened in the news. Let's complain. You're like literally talking about ideas. And it's just so, it makes you feel so alive, I think, to have those friends that you can yes, just dream does. with yeah it, like lights you up and it's just inspiring and it's fun and you know like you said it's like we we all have these ideas we all have these great ideas of wow wouldn't that be cool like oh we should create this or we should do this but so many people have the idea but they don't bring it to life yeah, and they don't take there. they don't take the next step so for you you had this idea on a napkin and then mm -hmm. you you brought it to life, but like, what were those first steps? So you're like, okay, I'm going to take the, the, the first action step towards this vision I have. Yeah. So I think, um, I think it's really important too, for, um, like things take time, you know, and I think sometimes that's where new entrepreneurs can get, um, frustrated. Like they just do, like I had this idea, I kept sketching it out and thinking about it. And then, um, I, I was still, Tra like a traveler and so I think when you're like a there's two ways you can travel before entrepreneurship is a certain kind of travel and after was a different kind of travel before you literally just like travel and you do anything all day long you're just like this free bird floating around seeing the culture it's amazing and 
this was after I had the idea, I had a trip planned really quick after that to Peru for a month. And it was the first time I was traveling internationally where my heart and my head like wanted to be working on this idea. I never had that sensation before. So I was actually having FOMO of wanting to be working while I was in Peru. Um, And so I could feel myself with this like first time ever having this like conflict internally of just like, I don't want to just have a carefree month of doing anything. And so I knew I really wanted to do this, which I think is of important first step is that the idea really holds on to you and you get excited when you think about it and it's all you want to talk about. Um, Cause I mean, guys, you guys know this, like when you really pick something, it takes years and years. So you got to make sure it's like the right mission for you to spend your years on. Yes. And then what I did next though, um, while I was like, you know, starting the first website and like learning more about uh, the recruiter side of it and things like that, I applied for this thing called crash pad in Boston and it's not around anymore. That business actually went bankrupt at some point. Um, but at the time it was like in its first year and it was just like the pinnacle moment of this business. It was so cool. And you could apply and get in and you would live in this three story house for four months. And there was 18 other entrepreneurs living there with you. And keep in mind, I was not really an entrepreneur at the point. So I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about a website, about marketing. Like I knew about nothing about nothing. <laughs> and I just really wanted to do it. I go into this house and it's full of people from Harvard and MIT who had graduated in the last few years. And they were just kickstarting their idea. And you're supposed to start it out, get mixed in with community and then move out. You're not supposed to live there forever. And you co-work together all day long. You're not allowed to have another job while you're there. So you co-work together on the second floor. You have these big, big family dinners on Sundays. On Thursdays, they bring in an entrepreneur, you know, like people who like started Uber, like people that started these huge businesses. And we would do a cocktail hour with with them where they would tell us their favorite cocktail. We would all make them. Um, And like someone could be like dark and stormies is my thing. So we'd all have dark and stormies that night. And we would like do a fire fireside chat with them, you know, like kind of like one of these, you know, but for them. So I had four months of like, for the first time in my life, being introduced to entrepreneurship communities. And I felt like such an imposter going into it, but coming out of it, like I had friends that are still such good, like such good, amazing friends. It was the first time I think I spent so much time around other people who like literally like we just said thought about ideas I never heard anyone gossip I never heard anyone talk bad about anyone else was always like encouraging ideas I'll help you with that um it was such a giving culture and I was like oh my god I love entrepreneurs and so I think I also fell in love with the people that start businesses which keeps you in it longer too when you start realizing it's way more than just trying to make a business you get a whole community and culture around it um so that helped a lot so I say that because I think community is like, I don't know how I would have ever, ever kept going with Nomadic Care without the different levels of community I've always had, you know, each year. And it started with this crazy crash pad thing. Okay. So we have to unpack a little bit okay. of that one. Why the hell isn't that still around? Pause. Jesus, Pete. I know, right? <laughs> I didn't know if you did that, but like, what a cool experience. And did you, so A, were you like, I'm going to take you know, three months, or you said you were there for four months. So I'm not going to take a contract. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to go and immerse myself in this like think tank kind of environment. Um, did you like, did you, you applied for it? Did they have to like pick you or did you have to pay to get in or what, what was like the details behind even getting into something like that as like a brand new, like baby entrepreneur? Mm -hmm. Good question. So they said on their website at the time, it was like, we only take 5% of the people that apply. And I put like my heart and soul into that application. And, um, and I did, I felt like such an imposter, like, like I wasn't really an entrepreneur and they accepted me. Now, I don't know for sure if I, 5% seems so small. I don't know for sure if that was like marketing, if that was for real, but they did definitely, they were booked out. Um, and the people, when I was there, especially the quality of those humans in that building was exceptional. So I, whatever it was, I'm, I love that I got in. Now they are not a, what's the right word? They're not like an incubator or they're not the thing that like takes equity to come here or something like that. You pay rent to be there and you are living in a room with another person. So you've, you're like bunked up or you can pay a lot of money to have your own 
room, but it really is meant to be community driven for people like mostly in their twenties. There's a few people like um, that were older there, but a lot of them were, cause I was only, I don't even know, young 25 probably. So there were some people that were 24, some that were 28. It was like all people in their twenties. And it was kind of like an entrepreneur hostel, but it was kind of expensive. I remember I like, was like, oh crap, well, I'm going to go do this. And, um, and I did, I took, I mean, how lucky if you want to be an entrepreneur and you are a traveler, dude, it's perfect. You literally can make money, save some, take time off and hustle and focus. If you're running low on money, you take another contract. So yeah, I just took a contract off and, and did it. Wow. Wow. And I mean, we talk about that all the time. And thank you for saying that because, you know, we were talking about in the last podcast about we feel that healthcare traveling honestly gives people an unfair advantage to most mm. of the world because we have the beautiful option to be like, I have this great idea. I can go travel. I can take time off, see if it has legs. And if it doesn't, I can go get another contract. If I need to be my own venture capitalist, I can get another contract and I can mm -hmm. take as much time off without losing my job. I mean, it's yeah. just a beautiful thing. It yeah. really is. And I love that you brought this up because Aaron and I just had a conversation about this and we were actually going to ask you about it, but I love that you said there's two different types of travelers. There's one that is traveling before they become an entrepreneur and the traveler that then becomes an entrepreneur and what their time management looks like. Because before Aaron and I ever had any thought of creating anything, building any type of business, it's like we would go somewhere and it was all about, okay, where can we eat? Where can we hike? Where can we travel? Where do we want to go? What kind of experience do we want to have? It was so fun. It was so rich. But then you start getting into, okay, now we're in a place where we want to build something. And so our time becomes, you know, we're going to work and on our time off, it's like, okay, what can we work on today? What can we, you know, what, what can we create today? What do we have going on? It becomes like a completely different experience you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh my God. So, so different. And I will say I am really grateful. I had both. Like, I'm glad I did a big Southeast Asia trip before I ever had a thought of entrepreneurship in my head. Cause I literally just like got to experience the culture and that freedom of just thinking and being curious and just learning myself in that trip. And like a few others, you know, when I lived in Australia and New Zealand, like all these things before, because it is, if you're really, really trying to start a business that I went back actually to Southeast Asia for six months, almost, I think, well, and I like stayed in, you know, Bali for two months in Thailand and it's cool. There's hubs there, there's co-working places and Wi-Fi, and you can do it, but, um, it is extra hard. Cause you do get FOMO. Like all these people you meet are like, come to this volcano with us. And you're like, how do I, yeah. say, how do I say no to a freaking volcano hike? But you have to, because there's something amazing to do every day when you're in these countries and meeting people that are just traveling. Yeah. So I was very hardworking. I could see a distinct difference between myself and 80% of the other entrepreneurs there and the co-working spaces. Cause I'd be there like, first thing in the morning, I'd be up from one to 3 a.m. because at the time difference, I needed to be in some American hours, you know, and I would, I would say no to 75% of the stuff and just give myself the days to explore what I wanted to. But I really, really love nomadic care. And I think that matters a lot. Like I had a clear mission. It was, it grows every single year, you know, and so I can see like traction and that's exciting and I'm learning and I, had community of other real entrepreneurs who were like really, really up to it. And there was a whole group of people too, who just didn't know yet, you know, how to really focus or work. And I had to make sure I was like, Laura, remember who you are. Remember what you're up to. You can, you can't have it. You can't have all of it. You can't have like the cake and eat it too, holding like you can't have it all. You can't play all day and travel all day and go to every volcano and build a business. So it's hard, hard. <laughs> I think it's a lot harder to um, then it's a lot harder than it looks on Instagram, you know, where you just see the pictures <laughs> of people like working by the beach and, and I have those pictures up. I'm like co-working and there's monkeys next to me in Bali. It looks freaking cool, but you know, you're just, you're working a lot. <laughs> it's a totally different type of travel experience when you're, yeah. when you're working and building something and, and also trying to travel. Yeah. It's just a different type of experience. It is, but I, I just kind of, I, I had an undercover thought here from what you were saying of just like, were you, 
were you always that disciplined even as a kid because you know i wear a necklace that says discipline matters mm -hmm. so i can remind myself that those are the things that i have to do because i i, I love something and i want to go for it and it's so easy to be like, God, we're in Palm Springs in the spring and there's all these people and they're wanting to do brunch and they're wanting to go on hikes and Kim and I want to build something amazing. So that discipline really does matter to be able to say no and not start resenting your business. And so were you always that disciplined or did you battle with that? Or was that something that you had the vision and you just knew that this was it and that kind of changed your trajectory? Uh, I think like, God, it's always baby steps. Jeez, like, no. So first of all, no, not disciplined as a kid, not a disciplined human by nature. Now I was messy. My room was never clean. I always just wanted to like play with my friends. I was social, like, no, disciplined, not. And I think, um, you know, I started a few businesses like before Nomadic Air, um, little ones, like one was like an autism uh, thing that was with OT. And then uh, the other one that actually was a legit business it was uh, Latimer Studios, which my brother still runs full time. He's like an incredible cinematographer, just crazy, incredible and books way out and years in advance in New England. But we started that together. And I think um, and I think like and I'll go I'll probably like this is the only reason like everything worked out. It's always about community. Me on my own. I've got a million ideas. I got shiny object syndrome. I'm an ENFP, which I like Myers-Briggs stuff, but P's, you know, P's are the ones that are more spontaneous and don't have all the perfect discipline. And I don't. So it's a lot about setting my self up because I, it's like you said, Aaron, you wear the necklace cause you know, it's needed. And I think at some point, um, yeah, at some point, I guess like the mission meant more, but the community I was around um, helped shape me because I think it really is true that you become the six people you spend time around, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I was like consistently in communication with these other people who also like, we would wake up in the morning. <clears throat> I know I'm kind of going down rabbit holes right now, but I, my <laughs> brain's thinking of different things, but I would, we would went through this whole stage where we'd wake up in the morning, 5.00 AM. And I'd do a phone call with a group of six other people every single morning on weekdays and we'd have to say like what we were grateful for but also the three main things we had to get done that day to get closer to our mission they had to be proactive and not reactive like reactive is answering emails proactive you're creating something um, and then did we get the things done from the day before and you could not give an excuse as to why or why not you just had to own it and be like nope i didn't do it and if you said nope enough like you would start realizing like you're not being true to yourself. What does your word even mean? And it helps you get the self-awareness. So I think little things like that helped me so much and I couldn't have done it on my own. I, I need those little things. They, they just motivate me and keep yeah. me excited. So I think you just, tr you trick yourself into it a little bit. <laughs> well, yeah. And I think, you know, what you said too, it's when you have a mission, you're so inspired by and excited about, and you want to share it and you want to put everything into it. It becomes a different type of um, what's the word I'm looking for, but it just becomes, it becomes more powerful where you're like, okay, yes, we could go on this weekend trip you know, here up to San Francisco, or we could go to brunch with these people, or we could do all of the things. And yes, that's fun. But also remembering why we're here. What are we working towards right now? What is our vision? What is our dream? And mm -hmm. it keeps things in perspective of like, okay, like this is the priority right now. And like, let's put all the focus into this right now, yeah. right? Because mm -hmm. the mission is bigger than just the- The small the minutia, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah. And that, that helps so much too, to be able to actually- write down what it is you're trying to accomplish. And even like, there's a huge mission I have for the industry, you know, that mm -hmm. I want to accomplish, but you also have to break it down to like, what am I trying to accomplish in the next three months? And to make even the three month mission exciting and worth like walking towards. And when you can write it down clearly and you can visualize it, what a difference it makes. Like, otherwise you just kind of feel like you're on a treadmill, you know, and you're not quite sure what you're walking towards it. You've got to, I think it's, crucial to define and see clearly what you're trying to do and then it and then it makes it way more fun you have it's almost like a, a game at that point right that you're trying to get to that next level and you can see what that actual level is
Yeah. A hundred percent. And I think too, like, cause you were in the very beginning, you know, you were, you were traveling, you were still working as an OT taking contracts and you had this vision of nomadic care and what you wanted to build and the business you wanted to create. And so in the very beginning, you know, what did that balancing, I'm doing quotes, like balancing act look like as far as you would go to work and then, you know, how many hours were you putting in? Like, what did those, that extra time that you have really look like? Because I think a lot of times, like we said, you know, we all have these great ideas, but the actual work that is involved in bringing those ideas to life and, and the, mm-hmm. I don't even like using the word hustle, but like, you know, the hustle, the grit, the determination, like what did that actually look like for you in the beginning when you were still yeah. doing both, you were still, you know, making money through being an OT traveler and building your yeah. dream business. Yeah. It, it, especially at the beginning when you are also working the nine to five, when I was like actually on assignments and trying to do pneumatic care, it is pretty all consuming. And so like, God, there's some people out there that are like moms that have all this other stuff going on. And I'm like, wow, like that was so hard for me to do both just like, you know, myself taking care of myself, working and doing it. But what it looked like for me at the beginning was um, I would work before work. Um, I have like a very distinct memory of a a longer contract I did at a school district. And so I had to leave the house by eight o'clock each day for this assignment. So I would get up at five and I hate getting up early. And so I've said this twice in the, this podcast, like that I got up at five. I hated it though. Like never was I a morning person, like, but I had to, I needed those two and a half hours in the morning to work and achieve stuff, or I just couldn't get the progress I wanted. So I had, um, <laughs> I had an alarm clock that I would put in my room to go off at four fifty-eight or whatever. And I had a second alarm clock that I would put outside of my roommate's door <laughs> for 5 a.m. And she worked, she lived, she was upstairs. I was downstairs. So when mine goes off, I would get out of bed because I am so terrified of letting people down. It's like one of those thing triggers for me. So I would get out of bed because I was so motivated by not waking her up because I'd be humiliated. I would get out of bed. If it was just my alarm, I would just snooze it and go right back to bed. I can I can let myself down. But so I would get out of bed, it would go up the stairs, get the alarm, turn it off. And then I had my little routine. So I wouldn't go back into my bed. I would wash my face and different things. And then I would be sitting in this kitchen table and oh my God, like in this old crickety house in Boston and, and be pitch dark. And I'd have this one light in my coffee, you know, and all of that. And I would work from five until I had, I had to leave for work and then, yeah, I'd come home and uh, the other girl I lived with at the time was also trying to start a business while she was working. So we both co-worked in the evening together and kind of made dinner together and stuff. So it was, it was like before work, after work, go to bed. <laughs> so it does, it takes up a lot of your life, I think. And I think it's like no joke that it, there is a sacrifice to doing it. So you, you have to kind of, I loved it too, you know, so you have to love it because it's, you don't love it. You're giving up a lot of your life to, to really try to start something. That's a, like a, that's so savage that yes. you would like <laughs> genius because that makes sense. it's like, if, if your alarm's going outside of her room and you don't get up and, and get it and she's going to be like, what the heck, Laura? Like, I know, you know? She's so pissed. Yeah. I absolutely love that too, because I mean, one, I wish Kim and I almost slept in different bedrooms because I don't ever want to wake her up. Mm-hmm. Like, that's just that that is it's just so genius it's a it's a good tip right yeah. but okay <laughs> how long how long did you do that for because like like that's not sustainable for a long period of time I mean of course it, it could be you know but like how long did you actually have to juggle both before you were like I'm going all in on nomadic care I'm gonna go for it I guess in my head I was I was always all in on nomadic care. Um, but I think what you're asking is like, when did I stop working and do it full time? And yeah, I like think when were you like, was... I'm going to give all of my time and all of my energy and take a contract off and really just give everything I have to this business? I think um, I did that continuously. Um, like I literally didn't overthink it too much where I was like, 
Um, this is it. I'm never going back to a contract. I don't think I ever said those words or thought those words. I literally would just work a contract and then just take, you know, probably half the year off or something to hustle, but Nomadicare didn't really make money for many years. So I, I would just take another contract and I went low on money and I had other ways too. I was a wedding photographer with my brother and I got pretty talented at like the photography side of it. So we were booking like better and better weddings. And so that helped too, because actually in the summers and falls of New England, Mm -hmm. I would go work um, a wedding on a Saturday and edit the pictures and everything. And that weddings, you know, you can make, you make like $3,000 a wedding or something. So I could just work a few weddings too. And that helped sustain me. So I, I randomly had like little ways of getting money to keep me going, but then I would, I would take a contract, but you know what, thinking through this, there was, and this might've been the last big contract I did. I was doing a home health contract and I had a complete breakdown in front of a patient's house. I mean, literally like a complete emotional breakdown. And it was uh, hitting a wall of just doing too much. Like, like you said, it's not sustainable forever. And I think it was, it was like the early mornings, the patient care, the home helps, you're driving around everywhere. And they kept, <laughs> they kept pushing my patients further and further away. So it's like more and more driving and um, my back was hurting, blah, blah, blah. I just like sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. And I ended up going to... Uh, I ended up quitting the, the contract was almost over, but maybe not extending it, whatever it was. I ended up like being like, I can't do this anymore. And I said, I think that might've been like a moment that I left that was like, all right, no Medicare, let's do this. But I I don't remember being so sure I would never go back and work another contract though. So, so you never had a a famously Kim and Aaron G. I love that story more than I like love that story of y'all. No, I never did burn the scrubs. And even today, I don't like, it's weird for me to be like, I'll never be an OT again, but like, I probably won't. Right. It's been a while since I've been an OT and I love nomadic care. We've got employees. We've got a million goals for the future, but it still feels like completely bizarre to say that. And I never um, didn't like being an OT. I think it matters too. I, I always liked the clinical work. So I didn't try to get out of it, you know, cause I didn't like it. I just, nomadic care just grew and I love nomadic care. So <laughs> here yeah. we are. I mean, I think that's something that Kim and I go through like to this day. I mean, it's not that, you know, Kim says it all the time, you know, we're kind of polar opposites. Like she's like, mm-hmm. you at least like what you do. You know, she's very vocal about not liking ultrasound um, anymore. Any, anymore. And it was a means to an end. And there are times that, yeah, like when I'm scrubbed in, I'm extremely passionate about radiology. I do love what we do for the patients, but I do feel like a bit of my soul is dying every time I go in. And mm. it's not because of the work. It's because of what I want to see myself doing on the outside. And so that's, totally. that's kind of an interesting concept. Like you said, that you still love that OT work. Um, and I think that's big too. Yeah, where I, on the other hand, was just sitting on the couch, I think it was yesterday, crying. Yeah, literally. <laughs> I, yeah. I kind of felt like I had hit that wall of just like, okay, like we, you know, it's been a couple of years that we've been, you know, building our business and working, and I really am not passionate about ultrasound anymore, and, you know, it's just, it, it, was, it was like I hit a wall of like, wow, like, and we're so close to being done anyways, but it was like, Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I feel very done. I'm so emotional about it. You know, I was like, I, we just need a break, you know, to kind of go all in on everything. But, um, but that's yeah, you know, it's right around the corner, which we're excited about. Um, okay. So you talked a lot about, you always talk about this is one of the things I love about you. And it seems like it was instilled from your dad, but about being brave and being bold and, you know, feeling fearful, but doing it anyways and showing up. Mm. And I know, you know, for you, like the beginning of your business, I mean, a huge part of it was, you know, selling this idea or pitching this idea to recruiters, to companies and getting them involved with Nomadicare. And, you know, what, <laughs> 
okay, just for me, like the thought of picking up a mm-hmm. telephone and cold calling like a, a CEO of a company or something and pitching my idea as a traveler, like, hey, I mm-hmm. want to change the healthcare industry. And I think you guys are doing it wrong. <laughs> or, you know. well, no, like, I mean, we literally, Kim and I have had this conversation multiple nights, uh, literally just like, can you just imagine Laura? Because like you said, you're a theater kid. You always think so big. You're you're always like positive and happy and just basically trying to tell them that their way of doing things sucks. You should just trust me. And that just like, were you like throwing up outside? Were you nervous? Like what was that first call? And how many notes did you get? Oh my God. Well, okay. So, uh, this is so funny. Yeah. So interestingly, first, when I started Nomadic Air, um, I did not talk to the CEOs or the leaders of the company. I talked to the recruiters directly. Now I don't do this this way anymore for a million reasons, but it doesn't matter. They're all technical about the, they're all like things I learned along the way, but at the very beginning I called recruiters and I would say like, Hey, look, um, I would say like this industry is kind of failed me and it's frustrating and all this and I'm looking for the best recruiters out there and if you want I'll interview you and if you pass the interview um you know I'll I could match you to travelers that come through and want a vetted traveler whatever it is and so they'd be excited I think because of the idea of wanting to pass an interview so most recruiters all were like yeah like let me do this interview and I would tell them yeah it's really hard most people fail it and they would be like oh I won't fail it but for sure three at the beginning of nomadic care three out of four recruiters failed the interview. And it, the interview was like, holy crap, like two or three hours. Oh um, and so I was just like interviewing nonstop and just failing people left and right. And I'm sure these recruiters were like, who the hell is this girl? I think she has the authority to tell me I'm a bad recruiter. But I was like, so sure about the things I wanted to change. And I would just be like, you failed, you failed. <laughs> and oh my God. I'm just and like thinking back, like it's so funny, like, but um, about one, one would pass. So I did 25 interviews in one week. I remember I, I wrote a blog way back then about the interview, the week I did 25 interviews and only six recruiters came out the other side. So I had these six recruiters. This is how it started. And no, I never got, had a contract. I didn't even think of Nomadica as a business back then. I wouldn't ever use that word, which, which I'll, I'll talk about that kind of interesting mindset later. But I, um, I just... I just used what the industry already had, which was a referral bonus method. Um, and so I didn't have to talk to anybody, you know, cause they would just write my name down. Now today we do it a hundred percent different. We're not even a referral bonus. Cause it turns out that comes out of the traveler's paychecks or a vendor. There's all these things, but this is way back from the beginning when I didn't know as much. So with six people, uh, the companies didn't even necessarily know about nomadic care. Didn't really matter. And then I did a, webinar this and this is way back when webinars were like new and it was exciting it's a live person talking to you and people showed up like 90 percent of people would show up because they were so excited so we had like over 200 people show up to the first webinar which today no one should like if you could do something live and people show up it's amazing everyone's always yeah. like, yeah. watch the replay later and then they never watch the replay you know like and so for that many people to show up is insane. And that was when Facebook groups were a different world. There wasn't so much spam in Facebook groups. You could just go in there and be like, Hey, I'm going to do this webinar to teach about like whatever my topic was probably getting started in travel or like how to look out for red flags and recruiters, whatever it was. Um, you could just post it in all the groups and groups didn't care back then. Now they'll like block you for posting anything, you know? So, um, so things were just different. So we had over 200 people show up. I did this live webinar and (laughs) I think it was like a hundred or 150 travelers signed up for a recruiter match. Wow. And I had six recruiters. <laughs> wow. And so at the time I was in this little office with my brother, that was the Latimer studios office, no windows, full, head to toe whiteboard walls. We had painted it with whiteboard walls. So there was this whole wall on the back wall that I literally like, this is how untech I was back then. And it's funny to my care is like a tech company now, but I wrote every traveler's name down on this whiteboard wall and I wrote their start dates next to it. And then I just like circled the ones that had to be matched that week because recruiters could only get like three or five um, travelers a week or they get overwhelmed, whatever it was. So I literally like one by one would match. And then I would write the other travelers and be like, 
you're going to get matched in two weeks because your start date is later. And travelers back then would wait. They'd be like, thank you so much. I can't wait for my turn and today. No, they're like, um, it's been an hour. Where's my match? Like, <laughs> and so it was like just such a different world, but it did. It started with these like 150, you know, amazing travelers that went through and said, yeah, we want, we want to be part of this six. Like you failed everyone. We want these the best people. We want to be part of it. And they waited their turn and got matched and everyone was so grateful. And it was really cute. And I think I originally matched them via Facebook messenger. Like I was so ridiculously like scrapping it together and I didn't know anything. And that's, that's how it began. <laughs> I love that story. Uh, it's amazing. Well, and he, okay. So before you even called your first recruiter, because you were, you know, basically just a traveler on the road. So, mm -hmm. you know, you're like, I'm going to match you up with travelers essentially. And I, you know, this is why you want to work with me or why you want to pass the interview, because I have an awesome group of travelers that, mm -hmm. you know, I can hook you up with, but so even before that, like, did you, cause I know you have the empowered travelers Facebook group where you do trainings mm -hmm. and you do all kinds of things, but were you doing that group or like, what was your social media presence before all of this to have the community for 200 travelers to show up to your webinar, which is amazing. <laughs> I know right? Were you already like teaching about the industry and, and kind of cultivating this community of travelers before all of this. Kind of, I think it's, a, it comes down to a lot of what we just are so based off of now anyway, which is the transparency. So I think as I was going through the process of like interviewing recruiters, I was in different groups um, at the time. And I don't even remember which groups it was like Julia's group wouldn't have been as big back then. I didn't have a Facebook group yet. Um, so I don't remember which groups they were, but I would be kind of like talking about my, what, what I was up to and people were kind of like a part of it with me, you know, they'd be like, oh my God, that's so cool. We'll make sure you ask them this. And I had a few recruiters that I was close to and one that had left the company she was with. And she was kind of like, girl, come up. Like she lived down the street from me or, you know, an hour away or whatever. And she's like, come to my house and I will tell you everything about the industry. And I sat down with this notebook and I had like 50 questions written down to ask her. And she like, we just had like wine and she like answered everything with no bias because she had just left. So I realized some of the things that were like really bad, like she helped me a lot. She's like, this is what you should look out for. This is a scam that recruiters do. And I didn't know all those things back then. So she was the first person to start teaching it to me. And then I would seek out other recruiters to really like tell me the truth about things. Now I know the industry like crazy, right? Probably one of the small percentage of people that know both sides really well. But back then I needed help for the recruiters to really explain it to me because I didn't know what was entitled yet. I didn't know what was fair or what was asking too much. And, um, and so I think people went along with the journey with me in these groups before the groups like stopped letting other people like post in their groups or whatever. And so they knew it. So they were excited to see how it all turned out. And then I started doing webinars, which no one else was doing at the point. And people were scared of live video. So I think by being on the front end of trends, instead of in the middle when people are kind of over it, just helps so much. So I, that's all I can remember. It's funny how you can look back and like not remember all the nitty gritty sometimes. I'm like, I don't know how I, how travelers started trusting me, except I was just posting a lot and being honest about what I was up to. Wow. No, I, you know, it's crazy. I don't even know if it's kind of one of those times that we said we are bringing the audience, people listening along to our normal conversation. So if this isn't a question, hopefully you can kind of pick up what I'm saying here, but yeah. like, you literally, in my eyes, in my opinion, are the grandmother of of travel, but not in a way that you're old, in a way that like you're the godfather, the godmother, in my opinion. Like you Change you have single-handedly changed the traject the trajectory of this industry towards fair for travelers. And mm -hmm. It's insane to me when you look at your story and, and seeing all the influence that are influencers that are out there and really getting to know you and watching your journey. It's just been incredible to see that one step after another, you you literally have changed that. And so it's cool to hear that this recruiter kind of helped you because that was kind of my question of like, were you just sitting in the house just being like, oh, this would be good. And then to not only have the idea, but then to have the companies start saying, well, shit, we better go along with this or we're going to get left behind. 
Mm. And you literally have done that. And I don't know if that was intentional or if that was just something that kind of happened along the way. Yeah, I think a little bit of both, like super intense. I've always been a bold, a bold dreamer, I guess. I don't know if always is the right word, but you know, since nomadic here, like bold, like I'm like, I am so sure I will transform this industry. I'm so sure about it. You know, like I know it, I can see it. I know what needs to happen. Like, so I do feel um, bold in what I'm up to. And so I think that is, is something that's like um, part, part of me, I guess. And then I think you're right. Like as it got bigger, I think there's like a confidence that came with that, especially when you really understand the industry. Like if you really understand it and you really understand why companies do what they do and what their motivation is and why recruiters say what they say and things like that. I can come now to the CEOs and the companies and be like, Hey, this is why it's fair. You're still winning. And the travelers are still winning. I think if, if I think there's travelers out there that are just so bad at giving advice because they don't really understand how it all works. They didn't take the time to learn like I did. I like sat in a lot of different staffing agencies. I sat with their CEOs. I flew to different places. I interviewed a million recruiters, not just for nomadic air, but for like a day in their life. Well, what does this mean to you? And why do you do this? And it, and so I took the time to do it. And you see like new grads out there now trying to be gurus in the industry, but really they're like hurting more than they're helping because they're teaching bad tactics. You know, they'll never get anywhere with the CEOs of the companies because they'll be like, you're, that's not fair at all. You don't understand how this works. <laughs> There's a legal tax law for that. You can't do that. You know, and they don't know these things yet. So I don't even know what the question was anyway, but I do feel very bold and like, I, I am here to transform the industry. It's what I'm here for. I'm not, I'm not here to tiptoe around it. It needs to be changed and I'm going to change it to help the travelers. Yeah. I love that. And I love that you and the recruiter sat down and had wine and like, what a cool opportunity to be able to pick the brain of a recruiter to get the juice, right. To get the <laughs> tea, to get the inside scoop and then be able to use that to then I'm assuming ask the questions on the interview because you were, you know, calling these recruiters and taking them through this vetting process, asking them very specific questions but as a traveler, you obviously had to learn the right questions to ask. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it seemed like she really kind of helped like mold that. Yeah. Like give you the insight into how you wanted to then move forward and the kind of recruiters you wanted to work with and stay away from, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. It all, it always is like a, gosh, it's always like breadcrumb I don't know there's like it's amazing she was a huge part at the beginning yeah. and then many other people have like been the next step and the next step and the next step but you're right like I'm so grateful for her to be that open and honest with me and I think it's lucky that I was friends with her and it's lucky that at I lived close to her when she was quitting. So she felt a little bit more fired up to tell me everything. I think she just left the company. Yeah. <laughs> I think the time the timing worked out really well too or she's like let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> <It was awesome. laughs> So here's a quick question, because this is something that I think is really interesting for healthcare workers in general is we're used to, I mean, I've been a stenographer for 13 years. Okay. So 13 years, my mentality is I go to work at seven o'clock. I clock in, I go through the grind. I do my patients. I get my 30 minute lunch and then I clock out, you know, at three 30 or seven, whatever my hours are, you know, for the day. And I'm very used to that clock in, clock out, do my work, come home. The rest of my free time is mine. Mm -hmm. So when you transition from that kind of mentality of working in healthcare to I'm an entrepreneur, I run my own company. I work for myself. My I'm, you know, in control of my time and my schedule and the way that I, I map out each day. What was that an easy transition for you to be like, I have 24 hours and I don't necessarily have to be anywhere at a specific time to clock in. Like, how did you, like, what does a normal day look like for you running your own business from home? And was that transition easy for you to, you know, allocate your time wisely to get stuff done without having, you know, to show up specifically for anything? Um, yeah, such a good question. And no, it's not easy. It's still not easy easy um because it just you have to be able to develop your own structure 
and follow it and do it consistently. And that's like, just not easy. Like it, it, the easier thing is when you're like, um, you have a whole 24 hours to be like, cool, let me just see what I feel like doing today and let me do it. But do you, you get to now be the one to be your own boss, which means you have to like hold yourself accountable and do all the things you don't like your boss doing. You have to do it to yourself. <laughs> so no, it's hard. Um, and, but I will say like one thing that's true is like, I never really liked working the nine to five jobs. Like I liked being an, an OT, the clinical stuff, but I didn't like that um, lifestyle that much. It didn't really ever suit me. And today I work a lot more hours than a nine to five, but I wouldn't trade it to go back, you know, to like clocking in, clocking out type of thing. Um, and I think that's always just tied to value. So like my values and my core is closely tied to freedom and it's closely tied to being a creator, you know, creating and, and yeah, honestly, those two freedom and creating. And, um, and so I think because of those, because of those values, like, and I guess intentional living too. So I do, I set my own, I set my own goals kind of way more advanced now because I have employees and a team. So we have to have like very clear goals for the team. I have to hold more people accountable than just myself, but it's still the same basic principles that I did early days of those 5 a.m. phone calls where I was like, what are my three most important things that are going to get me closer to the vision I have in three months from today? And you just can't lose sight of like, are the actions I'm taking today leading me to that goal in three months? Because it's really easy otherwise to just work a lot of hours, but you're not actually moving towards the thing you're trying to do. You're just answering emails and cleaning this up and, you know, you're doing stuff, but, but it's always like, how do you pick the right things to do? And I think it does always come back down to the clear vision of what you're working towards. Otherwise, who knows? You could just pick, there's always a million things to pick from off of a list of what to do. And you just might pick the random wrong things all the time. Right. Yeah. Did you, I mean, cause you said before that you were doing Latimer studios and you were picking up those, those photography, the wedding photography, but was there, was there yeah. everyone that you can remember that you were just like, Oh shit. Like I might need to go back to that steady gig. Um, because I mean, when you have something certain, like we know that Friday is a paycheck, maybe mm. it's bi-weekly, maybe it's weekly it's coming in and whatever you do on your off time, that's great for, for growing, but you know, that check is coming in. Yeah. Was there ever a time that you were just like, damn, what like, doing? what am I doing? <laughs> I'm uh -huh. steady, safe <laughs> like, gig. I got to pull the ripcord. For yes. the, fear of the unknown and the uncertainty. That's a big leap. A scary. <laughs> yes. Yes. I still have those thoughts today, especially as we grow bigger, it gets more scary. I think when you're now in charge of not just your life, but your employees, you're like, um, uh, I had to pay, I had to pay them too. Um, you know, like, I'm, like now they're counting on me for their livelihood and just like the pressure doesn't get less, I think as you grow. And so, yeah, some, some days I still wake up and I'm like, what am I doing? Like, this is crazy. Um, so yes, that's a true statement. Um, and there, and there were times I had to go back and work, but I think there's also another way to think about it. Like you can go back to work to make more money, but I also would do the other side of it too, which is how can I, um, how can I make this happen in the uncertainty and in times when I didn't have a lot of money, how do you still make it work? And one of the things I did when I was a bit low on money actually, but I, but nomadic care was also in a stage where I couldn't, it was like a real fork in the road for me. Like nomadic care was at a place that was beyond full-time. I was like exhausted. I was working so much. I was fresh out of a breakup. That was a, a breakup that for whatever reason was more painful. Like it just like sucked. And so there was this breakup. Nomadic care was absolutely drowning in it, but it was growing and I really needed to hire for help. And I did not have enough money for like rent and everything and to hire for help. And, um, you know, I was going through my own emotional stuff too. So it just felt horrible. It felt horrible. And I ended up, um, and like, God, thank you to Daniel, my brother and his wife. Like they let me move in with them for free. And I lived in his basement and the basement room he has is tiny. It had a twin size bed and 
it took up the whole room where I couldn't even walk around the outer side. I'd have to climb over it to get to the tiny little closet on the other side. There was this itty bitty bathroom that was smaller than like RV bathrooms and the toilet usually wouldn't flush. And like, it was just insane. And the window was a tiny little crack. If a house was on fire, I couldn't have climbed over it. So it's like this tiny, 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 tiny room. But they were like, live there. Um, and and stay with your dream. Like you're doing something, it's working, you, you can do this. And so I moved in with them. I got a um, office space that was walking distance from there. Her, her mom, Lori's mom, sister-in-law's mom, um, gave me her car for like $200. And it was, <laughs> it was the oldest, worst car ever. And when you drove, the wheel was like off its axis. I don't know, it sounded like a tambourine. So it'd be like a jingle on my way to work. And I was like, work was like a mile away and I would go there got my very first office and the office was maybe four hundred dollars a month I can't remember six hundred dollars a month something so cheap and um I signed it I signed the papers the wallpaper was like peeling off I think this office was over a hundred years old and he was like yeah you can like repaint it if you want to so I would be there till 3 a.m in the morning scraping this wallpaper off and painting it and I mean insane insane and I hired um I hired my first team and I painted these walls and I printed up my own little decorations or we could have the mission on the wall and I had all desks that didn't match that were donated like and just unbelievable and and I went for it and I think that was actually a big moment for me saying I choose this and I'm very scared and I'm don't really have the money for it right now but we're gonna do this and you know that so I did I lived in the tiniest room ever for a whole year and <laughs> I hired my team and they would get paid for my savings when I wouldn't, I don't think I made my own money that year hardly, but, but then it grew and it worked. And no matter, I mean, that year was very significant in nomadic care becoming what it is. You can do so much more with the team. And that team was saints. I love them. I love them. I love them so much. They were just such great, great workers. So I love yeah. that. Like I have like chills listening to yeah. that story. Cause it's like, what you like you're describing this room and you know it's just like but how exciting that you are building your dream you know you're driving this like ratty old car which i think we saw i think we saw it i think you drove <laughs> connecticut you probably did i can't even believe it made it there <laughs> but like what an exciting time of just kind of like bootstrapping this business bringing your dream to life you know just one step at a time just keep like believing in yourself and showing up for it and committing to that vision and just having the support around you to be like, okay, like I got this, like, I'm going to keep moving forward with this. And I don't know. It's just so, it's so inspiring. Too. Well, you, you basically said it without saying it. I mean, it just goes to show the, the bold, the brave and the belief that you had not only in yourself, but your mission. And to just be scared and to be hiring people when you're paying them out of your own savings and knowing that there's not a ticker like, oh, crap, I'm going to be broke. And just <laughs> knowing that you're going to always find a way. I, I think that's what I love about you the most is just it just always seems through just the short amount of time that we've known each other. You just always find that way. There's always that grit. There's always that belief in the next best thing. And I, I just I don't know. I, I just have a lot of respect for you in, in that way. So. Thank you for just bringing that on without even saying it. Oh, thank you for that. That's so nice to hear that. And I think it's too like a, a testament to other people who, you know, or not a testament, but like inspiration for other people who want to build something. And it's like, anything is possible. Like you can figure anything out when you believe in something and you have a mission and a purpose and you want to create something, you can figure it out. There's ways to make things happen. It doesn't have to be overcomplicated. You might live in a basement and drive a car. That's a tambourine. But like, <laughs> I think it's out. like, how willing are you to be uncomfortable? Yeah. I mean, like, and that's also why I think travelers, um, healthcare travelers make amazing entrepreneurs. We like, we know how to be uncomfortable and, and thrive in it. Traveling 13 weeks at a time to unknown places isn't necessarily comfortable. So I think it is, it's how willing are you to be uncomfortable for something bigger that you believe yes, in? Girl. Yes. I mean, that yes. matters a lot. Yeah. I love that you said that. Wait, before we, we have just a couple more questions and we'll wrap it up. We could literally sit I here. Know. All oh, it could day. be, we could talk for like three hours. This is our usual. I know. I know. <laughs> but um, just real quick, I did, I just thought of this, but 
you know, as far, cause we always talk about using traveling contracts. They've been our investors. Like when I say like Aaron and I are investors in our business ideas and basically like our venture capitalists to fund these ideas and businesses we want to create. Did you always invest in Nomadicare on your own or did you have investors or uh, outside help to help you grow this? It sounds like you kind of just did it all on your own. Yeah, I did always do it on my own. And I love that mindset of like, when you do do a 13 week assignment and you're not super excited about it as an entrepreneur to think of it that way, be like, yo, I'm fundraising. This is fundraising for my dream. And it just gives it another another feeling about why you're doing it for again, something bigger in your life. But no, it, it was, it's always been my own money, period, period. Like um, pe- what I will say is people helped me along the way. Like my brother letting me live with him for free is huge. And my mom helped me the first few years and there'd be times I didn't have any money to pay her and, um, and she would just work for free. And then I would pay her later when the money came, you know, I'd like, <laughs> I would like keep a tab cause I never wanted her to, to work for free, but my family was huge. And so I do think it takes a, a team, but I never had investors. And, um, I will say like, and I kind of do want to talk about this cause I think it's interesting, just a mindset thing for a lot of years when I started nomadic care, I wouldn't call it a, um, a business. I would call it like a mission or a project or something. And, and I listened to Rachel Hollis maybe two years ago and she talked about it in her book. I think the, uh, what is her book? The girl don't girl wash her hair or something. Girl, girl wash, wash her face. Her face. <laughs> and, um, yeah. And I think she talked about like her doing that too. And she had this business that was making like six figures and it was a blog and she was a mom, but when she would go out and stuff, she would like underplay it and be like, oh, I just have this little blog. And I was like, oh my God, I would underplay mine all the time too. And I think there was this piece in me that kind of felt like the imposter syndrome, or it's just like, I don't know, women just don't talk that boldly. And I didn't have that representation yet. And I think when I first started like really feeling more proud of myself was when I started getting around other successful people in the industry and I put success in quotes but you can't see me but I'd start going to a lot of conferences where other people had like big names and stuff and I would listen to them and realize like wow like they just raised money so they get to have like press releases and stuff but they don't have a bit of income they haven't actually done anything yet and I'm like wow like I have done so much on my own in this industry. Like I deserve to say this is a business and it's a tech. And I will, like, I listen to other tech companies and I'm like, oh my God, we have tech that does way more than that. Why am I like, we're, we're an amazing health tech company that's changing the industry and it's a business that's successful that employs people. And I did it myself. And it took me a long time, I think, to feel confident and being proud of that instead of being like, oh yeah, it's this little mission thing I'm working on. So yes, it's, um, it's a business that I funded myself and I'm very, very proud of that now. I love that. I love that you're owning that because you are such a badass. Yeah. And yeah, just to own, like you've built this like foundation from the ground up that is changing the industry and inspiring so many people and educating so many people and empowering so many people and bringing community together. And what you're doing is really creating a ripple effect throughout the industry. And you are a badass business owner. Yeah. I love that you're owning, yeah. you know, like loud and proud. Like we have to own and we have to take, you know, responsibility for what we're creating in our lives, you know, and, and share it boldly and bravely because it inspires other people to then do the same. Right. You know? and, I, and I think totally, even yeah. good. No, I just, I even think like through our, just looking at our mission in our kind of journey, you know, Kim and I have always been very bold in that. Yeah. Of just saying like, yep, we run a business. And I mean, listening to a bunch of people, we could almost even lead them to believe that we have 10,000 employees just because we kind of like really have that vision and that belief that whatever we're doing, we're going to be successful. It is going to be a business. So it's kind of interesting to hear the other side mm-hmm. of it of like when you were just like, you know what, I need to own this where Kim and I are just like, mm. we fucking own it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love that. Yeah, it is. it is. We should own it. We should own it, especially, I mean, I think for whatever reason, especially like females have a harder time just yeah. like owning that side of themselves instead of being like, well, it's like a mission and it's this and all that. And I'm like, no, we like, 
I love it. I love now having just such a good circle of incredibly inspiring people that, you know, help me own stuff too and not downplay my own accomplishments. But anyway, yeah. You're like, I just say that to hope, I say that to hopefully inspire, you know, other women too. Cause I think this is, I, I see it a lot in a lot of other people too. And I'm like, girl, you're doing huge things. Like don't, don't doubt yourself. Don't dim your light. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So what would be anybody who's listening to this that's also a traveler that has a great idea or a dream of starting something on the side or some kind of mission or passion that they want to put energy into do you have any tips or i guess what would be one tip that you would give a brand new entrepreneur coming in and wanting to create something on their own i know there's probably so many but if you could just think of one for like a newbie mm -hmm. baby entrepreneur yeah, I would say, um, I would just say get in the arena, which literally just means just do it. Like, don't overthink it too much. Um, I mean, you can hear from some of my stories. Most of the time, I'm literally doing the next step with the skills I have that day towards something I believe in. And that's still what I'm doing today. I just have a lot more skills today. And then in five years, I'll have way more skills than I do now. But you always just do the next step, but take action. Like get out of your head, get out of your own way, get out of overthinking it, but take the next action step, like do it. And you're, the action is what grows your confidence. The action is how you actually learn to do the next thing and the next thing, but you don't, you don't need to know everything to get started. So, you know, take a deep breath, believe in yourself and uh, allow yourself to be bad at first, allow yourself to be really bad at first. <laughs> doesn't matter. We're all so bad <laughs> at the beginning. My, my first website is, was so ugly and the way I would piece things together, it makes me laugh so hard now. Um, who cares? Like do it do it anyway. So just do it. <laughs> Go for it. it. I love that. I, I, I'd i kick myself if I didn't ask you this, because it just kind of came up for me. But I know you and I like when we get in a room of us three, like you and I are literally just shooting moonshots at, at like <laughs> anything. And Kim's like, whoa, bring it down. Whoa, like, <laughs> how are we going to do that? And you and I are just seriously just rolling. We're big thinkers. And uh -huh. I feel like being somebody that's a big thinker, I struggle so much. And Kim and I had this conversation this morning. I'm always trying to think down the road of like, well, if we have these people or we have this audience, like I don't want to lose them. I, I want to provide so much value. And, and, and what if we don't have that set up right now and we lose them and all these things. And like, I just want to make it valuable and we need to be thinking 10 steps down the road. And mm -hmm. she's just like, we have so much on our plate. Let's just think of the next step. What can we do? Mm -hmm. so fear that I'm going to miss out on an opportunity if I don't think it way down the road. So do you have any advice to help me with that? Yeah, well, I would say, thank God you have each other. Like yeah. both of those skill sets are huge. And the fact that you have like your besties in each other that can balance each other out to like dream big and think through the next step. Like you guys are the power team. So I think one, don't shame yourself for it. It's an incredible skill set to dream big and have the heart that you do and, you know, the passion that you do. And then it's equally massively huge skill set to like, to be like, what do we do next? And what do we do now? And let's not get in our own way by overthinking it. And let's not get in our own way by asking too many, well, what if and why? And they, those bring up so many like fear fear things you know because you, you don't know you have no clue what will be in a year there'll be so many opportunities you don't even know of yet because you guys are about to have an insane adventure ahead mm -hmm. so I think it's like the balance but you guys luckily like so luckily have each other to help with that balance um which you know many people don't have that so yeah I, I think just like yeah just being like look at us look at us <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah. It's cool <laughs> too even as just a, a solo person is too give yourself freedom to dream big and, and, and take your vision to the next level, but then, and cause that's fun. And it's like mm -hmm. part of the process and, and the fun is in the dreaming aspect, but then sit back down and be like, okay, like, cool. Like what are the next three steps I can do today based off what you said, which I loved based off the skills I have today. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Let's do those, check the box. And then tomorrow, what are the next three things? So then you're, so, you're slowly building towards that big vision. Mm -hmm. But for me and my brain, I have to like um, structure it down to the nitty gritty detailed micro steps to get there, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, big time. And I mean, you, and I think the other thing is to, 
you know, acknowledged with, with yourself and you two, like you guys have what you need for both. Like, I remember when you were doing the course, um, and I loved the pictures you had of like your post-it notes of what each thing was going to be. And like, you had this amazing structure of what the vision would be and broken down to steps. And then on your weekends, me and you guys like filmed that thing over like a contract for hours on the weekends and put it together. But I think you, you guys already have the skill sets for both. The dreaming is exciting and fun and you have to know what you're going after. And sometimes you just want the space to dream just for, like dreaming can be fun period end of story just as its own little its own little experience without having to do what you dream up to so sometimes you just have margaritas and dream for the sake yes. of dreaming and that's okay that you're not going to chase every single dream but it keeps you at that part of your brain alive which is like can feel like a hit of a drug you know like fires you up because you're just like wow there's so many possibilities and then the next day you wake up and you're like, okay, but we still only have this many hours. Which possibility are we actually going to do? <laughs> yes, I love that. Okay. Uh, ending this off, what, anything new you want to share about Nomadic Care? Where can people find Nomadic Care? You, all of the things you want to share. All of the things. Well, okay. There is, there is one more um, story that I would love to tell. Okay. Um, because I think, I mean, it, it doesn't have to do with Nomadic Care. It's just my favorite story. And I never, ever, I don't think I've ever told it before out there. And I think like it's, it's my favorite story of yes. myself with Nomadic Care. And I just haven't said it yet. So I want to, but there was a time, this is kind of the segue between when I was only talking to recruiters. Well, at some point everything changed, right? Where now I only talk to the CEOs and leaders of companies and go down the other way. Now, why in the world would the CEO talk to me? Well, for, there was like a year that um, all of my friends that like, you know, I helped plan TrapCon, all of those people, Joseph Smith, everyone was like, Laura, if you want people to take you seriously, you have to go to SIA, you have to go to this conference. Well, um, SIA is the conference that you can only go to if you're on the leadership team of the staffing company. So it is pretty much exclusively the CEOs and, and the COOs and the decision makers of these multi-billion and million dollar companies. Now, this is early days for me, and I do not have money, like per use of all my stories. In my early days, I didn't have much money. And the conference ticket was $3,500. I was like, I cannot go to this conference for $3,500. Um, but they kept telling me, like, you have to go, you have to go. And so I made a decision, like, I'm going to have to go. I'm going to go there this year. I have to figure out a way to, to get there without spending that much money. And so what I did was I had a different skill set. I was also a professional photographer. So I went on to the SIA website and I saw they had like all stock imagery and I was like, hmm. So I wrote the head of SIA and I was like, can I come and take photos of the event? Here's like examples. I've done TEDx talks. I've done this, I've done conferences. I can take amazing photos and you don't have to use stock images for free. I just want a ticket. I want to be able to go and I want to be able to represent Nomadicare when I go, but I will take pictures. And they, um, not only wrote back and said, yes, sounds good, but they were like, we'll also make Nomadic Hair a sponsor yes. of the conference. So I got to go on the website as Nomadic Hair under sponsorships. And I was like, holy crap, this is like, I don't know, a $10,000 package. And, and so then I'm going there, um, which uh, I am like blown away, excited. And I think they even paid for my flight. Like it was just beyond, beyond me. I get there though. And I'm like, well, crap, all these CEOs are going to think I'm the photographer. Like that's <laughs> not good. So what do I end up doing? I go, I have to take pictures. So every room I go into and take pictures and listen to the speaker, I go, well, I have to ask a question then at the end of every single talk. So people will realize I'm in this industry and not a paid photographer. And so every talk, the whole time I would be thinking of a really good question to ask. Like, I didn't want it to be a throwaway question. I wanted it to be a good question, but I always wanted to ask a question. So every single talk all day for the whole thing, I would raise my hand and ask a question and always be like, I'm the founder of Nomadic Care, recruiter matchmaking, like something at the beginning. So, so they would know. And then I would ask a really thoughtful or challenging question, you know, and people would literally like turn their head and be like, who is this chick? Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so, and I literally, oh my God. And even the biggest keynote speaker in the room of everyone, which is hundreds upon hundreds of CEOs. And I was like, I promised myself I'd ask a question at every fucking talk. So I raised my hand in this huge room and asked a question that was beat red. Um, but I did it every time. And sure enough, by the end of the conference, I met like everyone I wanted to meet. I got, I became friends with like presidents of the biggest companies, which impacts a lot of things later. So I love that story. Cause I'm like, dude, like it's sometimes, sometimes it's even better to not buy the ticket. Cause I also got to hang out with the leaders of SIA. Cause I got, I was a photographer. So I got to hang out with them the whole time in their little side room too. And I was like, this is the best possible outcome for this. Oh so I just God. love that story. And I don't think I've ever gotten to tell it before. And I'm like, so I fun. love that because it's like, a, you're so scrappy. Like, yeah. you, you know, it's like, again, you figure it out, figure out how to get yourself into the room. And one of the things that I love about you, because even just as a friend, when we are on the phone or we're together in person, you always ask the best questions where it really is thought provoking. It's, it makes you think it makes you like kind of take a step back and be like, huh, that's, uh, let me actually take a moment to think about this. And like, you always do that. And I don't know, it's just one of the things that I love about you because we know every time we're with you, we're gonna have these like really fun, thoughtful conversations that are usually always sparked by some kind of a question mm -hmm. that you ask. And I also love that you were probably terrified to mm -hmm. stand up terrified. Like, like I thought I was going to faint and throw up. Yes. <laughs> like I'm literally, my heart was pounding when you were talking about standing up in front of all the CEOs and you all, you know, you're a newcomer into the industry and you're, you know, this, this young girl in a room filled with, you know, these big, like important, powerful CEO, probably most of them men. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Big time. Yep. Big seriously. And you want, you know, you want to show, you know, you stuff, but to be able to think of a question and just be like, I'm scared, but I'm going to show up anyways. I'm going to ask my question through a shaky voice, through beet red skin. And I'm going to show these people who I am and what I know is just such a testament to like who you are as like a human. Well, I, I do have to ask, number one, uh, I'm trying to break down what Kim said. It's nice to be able to turn the table on you and ask the questions um, and, and, yeah. and, and kind of get there first. Um, but secondly, being that we got the opportunity to go to SIA, and yes. being there with you and knowing what that room is like and the magnitude of that room. And then also having, I was going to raise my hand and ask a question and I think they didn't see me because I was shaking so bad, but then oh, the yeah, yeah. <laughs> girl, uh, yeah, hand in the back and to hear your voice and then mm -hmm. to instantly just, you know, hear that. Hi, I'm Laura, CEO of Nomadic Hair. And like, I instantly got nervous for you. <laughs> yeah, it's terrifying, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and you were the one asking the question. I just wanted to go like, give you a hug and tell you it was going to be okay. But you were just owning it. And it was just like, wow, like that's something that I personally need to work on. So that was like an inspirational moment for me as well. So yeah, it's just crazy hearing that story. You're a badass. Oh man, you guys are badasses. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, let's go. I, I actually wanted to say, so number one, like anything new with nomadic hair moving forward that you feel comfortable sharing, what's a vision um, that, that you're seeing for nomadic hair and then also yeah. where can people find you. Yeah. So I think uh, newest nomadic hair, we've got, we've got some really, really big things rolling out this year um, in, in 2021. And I'm sure we'll, you know, hop on and talk about that when it happens. So I would say like, follow along. There's something really big coming out, out soon. That's really, really, I'm really excited. I just am so excited, but right now there's also new things that are already out. So um, nomadic air, big picture, what we're most well known for is recruiter matchmaking. And that is still um, the vetted recruiters, but it's expanded because we're a tech company now. So you can tell us where you want to go travel to and um, benefits you need. And we've got all these different companies now and we can see into their back end and all that. So we know, look, you want to get to Rhode Island. Here's the people you should be with. They've got exclusive contracts or better relationships. So um, and they're vetted. And one of the things that Aaron was like implying earlier, many of our companies pay the nomadic care travelers more than other travelers for many reasons. You guys have a great reputation as nomadic air travelers, but also we've just pre-negotiated things for you that are fair for travelers in general. So there's that. 
We have the anti bait and switch job board um, that we update more than any other job board in the industry um, for a marketplace. So all these companies post their jobs on there. Now that's good for just seeing where jobs are too. You can select your specialty and look and be like, well, are there jobs in the place I'm even dreaming about going to? And how much about do I get paid in that area? So use it for your research, but also use it to get matched to jobs if you want to. You can set job alerts. So that way you're notified if you're a specialty and you really need to get to a certain place, but there's nothing on the job board right now, set an alert. So you will actually get an email. It's like, yo, a job opened up here, apply, go, go, go. And then of course the empowered group on Facebook. It's, I think it's the empowered travelers group, but I'm doing a lot more trainings in there, especially recently that are cool topics and big topics. So I'd love for you guys to join me in that group as well. And then I'd say to talk to me personally, uh, we have a text line. So literally you guys can write this down. You can text us anytime. It's me um, or another like human expert, like we'll talk to you. You can ask questions to us about anything about the industry. We are pros. And that number is 512-641-8111. Literally save it in your phone and text us. And then you can email us at hello at nomadicare.com. We yeah, will also put that. all of this in the show notes. So if you want the number, the email, the links, everything will be in the description. So we'll make it super easy and definitely join the Empower Travelers group. I love the whole series you're doing on trainings. I actually watched the one with Joseph Smith when we were talking, you guys were talking about the AMN lawsuit and what's going on with that. Just value packed. You guys don't waste words. When you are on, you are adding value, you are teaching people about the industry, and it is just so worth everyone's time to go and to learn the things and um, and connect with well, you. Well, not only that, the community yeah. itself is badass. So, but I, I do, I want to ask one final question here. So Nomadicare achieves everything that you've literally wanted it to achieve. You're just, mm -hmm. you're down the road. What is that overall impact that you want to leave behind with Nomadicare? Well, when it's all said and done at the end of this <laughs> whole road, um, I, um, the impact is that the industry is now a transparent industry. And what that means, that the word is, is so real to me. It's not just like a value word. Like as of a lot of things today, us as the healthcare workers, as the travelers, we don't get to see all the cards of what is the hospital like? like paying and why does this company pay this and this one not pay as much? It's so hard to compare apples to apples or, or understand like why the industry works the way it does or, or why we get tax-free money here. It's so freaking like um, not transparent. And what that does is leads to higher anxiety for these healthcare workers that are out working these assignments. So they always have it in their back of their head. Like, should I have gotten a better deal? Did I do it right? And, and, on the other side of what we are creating, it's just going to be literally a different experience as a traveler of how you can see data, what you're able to do with your own control. Because big picture, I don't think it's fair at all in this industry, which is a service industry. It's healthcare workers that, I mean, just do amazing hard stuff it shouldn't be set up where they can get taken advantage of because they're accidentally with the wrong recruiter. It shouldn't even be allowed. <laughs> and so I, so the other side of this, the whole way that we'll be able to use technology to bring transparency to the healthcare traveler, to put them literally more in control of their career. So we're not so dependent on that one human that we cross our fingers, tells us about jobs when they open, tells us the truth about what they're paying, submits us as quick as they say they're going to submit. Uh, we want we want to see that stuff, and we are more than capable and smart enough to understand, you know, bill rates and stuff if they're presented the right way. And technology can allow that, allow that transparency, allow beautiful design, allow speed of submitting, um, and ultimately more freedom and control. So I don't know if that's a little bit vague. Um, I have a very clear, clear way I want to achieve this, but big picture, that's what I want to happen and what I want the travelers to get. I love that. No. I, I'm so excited to follow along with you and your mission and your journey and what you're doing for this industry. I only wish that 
you know, this would have been going on nine years when I first started. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah totally. <laughs> but I'm so excited for the new travelers coming into the industry that are able to really maximize their experience by using the resources and tools and community that you've created, my friend. Yeah. So thank you for showing up and sharing your journey with us today. We are so happy always to talk to you and you're so mm-hmm. inspiring and you're such a good friend. And we just... We just absolutely love you. And um, gosh, yeah, I yeah. guess we'll just leave it at that. And we'll <laughs> obviously the invitation is always open to come back on the pod. We always have plenty to talk about. I think this is the longest podcast we've ever done. Yeah. Very <laughs> usual. We have so I much know. to talk about. I could never, I know. I just, I just can't get, I love talking to you guys. So yeah. So fun. So we will, um, we'll talk to, what? No, she's like, she's like over here. She's like punching me. Yeah, she's over here picking flowers off of the uh, table. It's like, just finish what you're saying. (laughs) So with that, thank you so much. And um, yeah, this has been great. Thank you for your time. Awesome. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'll talk to y'all soon. All right. Bye-bye. All right, guys. So that wraps up this week's episode with Laura from Nomadic Hair. I mean, wasn't that an amazing episode? I swear, every time we talk to Laura, we leave just feeling so inspired and so happy and so ready to take on the world. She just has that infectious energy, and we hope that's what you got from this episode. So definitely screenshot this episode, send it to her, share it out to your friends. Go check out Laura at Nomadic Hair. We will put the link in the description below. Um, go follow her at her an empowered traveler, uh, Facebook group. And yeah, that wraps up this week and we will be continuing these episodes, uh, next week with a new interview of a traveler turned entrepreneur. And we hope you'll come back next week and listen. Um, all right guys. 